Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, I want to introduce myself briefly, and then we have a, a terrific panel uh, to talk about the 100 Days mission and delivering countermeasures more rapidly. Um, I think everyone obviously knows that the pandemic was a catastrophe. Uh, we all also know what a destabilizing event it was. The, the geopolitical effects of the pandemic uh, continue to reverberate. Most of the issues confronting political leaders today, the so-called polycrisis, have roots in the destabilization that the pandemic caused. I think it's important to remember that this was the second pandemic of the 21st century. I worked in the White House during the first one, and after the first pandemic, I had the opportunity to debrief with President Obama. And I, I told him that in our response in 2009, we didn't dodge a bullet. Nature had shot us with a BB gun. And the response um, was not validated uh, by virtue of the outcomes. The outcome was determined by nature. Imagine if we had had two COVID scale events within a decade. That is certainly within the realm of possibility. Uh, all of the trends that are driving the emergence of infectious disease are, are going in the wrong direction. And we are in, in a state of heightened risk I think infectious diseases and pandemics are truly a 21st century threat and one that we need to address systemically. Six years ago, yesterday, uh, a number of world leaders, industry leaders, stood on the main stage here in Davos at the World Economic Forum and established my organization, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, to focus on developing vaccines against emerging infectious diseases. Three years ago at the World Economic Forum in 2020, we were watching COVID explode in China. In fact, on the Thursday of the 2020 World Economic Forum, CEPI announced its first vaccine development partnerships, that there were still fewer than 1,000 cases of uh, COVID that had been counted worldwide. We announced partnerships with Inovio, with the University of Queensland, and importantly with Moderna to produce clinical trial material and speed their vaccine into clinical trials. The medical and scientific response to the pandemic was nothing short of heroic. The political response, perhaps predictably, a, a little less so. I think. I think we can all acknowledge that. The response to the pandemic has been marked by considerable inequity of access to medical countermeasures and particularly to vaccine. There are many root causes of the inequity that we experienced during the pandemic. I think two are really important to call out. Um, one is structural. It's how vaccine manufacturing is currently distributed. Political leaders in countries with vaccine manufacturing capacity have to address the needs of their own populations first, particularly in times of scarcity. I think the World Economic Forum, again, is showing prescience in, in leadership. Uh, they have, with the U.S. National Academy of Medicine, Victor Zhao, um, and CEPI, set up a regional vaccine manufacturing collaborative to develop a framework for regions that want to expand their vaccine manufacturing capacity. And we'll have a closed door meeting later today to talk about how that framework can be improved and then shared with regions that are interested in increasing their manufacturing capacity. And Minister Moreno, I think, might want to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but the other root cause of the inequity was scarcity. Where there is scarcity, there will be inequity. And that's the, the <coughs> driver of the 100 Days mission. This is CEPI's goal that we've articulated, which has now been embraced by the G7 and G20, to accelerate vaccine development even over and above what was achieved in 2020. 
uh, to be able to deliver vaccines to new threats within 100 days. That would give us a fighting shot of preventing pandemics altogether and certainly of reducing their impact. Um, CEPI is also working on the uh, manufacturing issue. And today, actually, we have announced a new partnership with Institute Pasteur Dakar, uh, who is building a modern, modular, flexible manufacturing facility in Dakar on the African continent that will be able to deliver vaccines for Africa's use uh, and to be able to respond to future pandemics. It's the first of a manufacturing network of developing country manufacturers that CEPI um, has announced. We're, we're delighted about that. But today's topic is speed. How can we deliver medical countermeasures more quickly? What will it take politically? What will it take <coughs> scientifically? What will it take in terms of regional planning? So I am really delighted uh, to introduce the panel today. We have a terrific panel of very experienced leaders uh, with different perspectives. Uh, immediately to my left, of course, I think all of you know the right Honorable Helen Clark, the uh, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, and importantly, the co-chair of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. Um, to her left, uh, the Right Honorable Tony Blair, former Prime Minister of the UK, founder of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. We're delighted to have Honorable Minister Silvino Augusto Jose Moreno, the Minister of Industry and Trade from Mozambique, and Dr. Albert Borla, a trained veterinarian, but of course, the CEO of Pfizer, which delivered more vaccine more rapidly than any other company during the response to COVID. Um, Helen, let me, let me turn to you um, and ask you a, a, a really important question on the political side. In, in the midst of the poly crisis, in the midst of, of um, political turnover, uh, how do we maintain political attention to pandemic preparedness and response? How do we maintain the thread, keep the focus? In a way, we're back to the future at WEF, aren't we? Three years ago, COVID was exploding in China. Here we are again, and tragically, it's exploding in China. And that, um, in the sense that it's an ill wind that blows no good, uh, will keep COVID in the headlines and at the forefront of uh, leaders' attention in a way that it might not have three years into uh, a pandemic. Uh, when we uh, wrote the Independent Panel for Preparedness and Response report, we were very conscious that there had been 16 previous such reports and commissions who wrote with recommendations, most of which uh, sat on a shelf, and that it was very easy to enter a, a cycle of panic and neglect as the immediate heat of the storm passed. I think uh, around the world, populations <coughs> are over COVID, but as we know, COVID ain't over us and requires a continuing level of focus. And also, of course, it remains the moment to seize, to make lasting change so that the world can cope with a future uh, outbreak with pandemic potential far better than we were able to do on the run this time. Can, can I say, I'm actually quite encouraged at the number of trains that are moving in response to not only the independent panel report, but a, but a range of other reports and recommendations too. You do have negotiating processes in Geneva for a new pandemic uh, legal instrument of some kind. You have the international health regulation review process underway. You have the pandemic fund at the World Bank. Not a lot of money in it yet, but you know, <coughs> it's, it's, it's work in progress. WTO made a, a little progress, but you know, a, like to see more, but you know, it, it, it's focused on, on the task. Uh, countermeasures, there's a lot of discussion and, and debate going on, and undoubtedly we'll hear more about that today, and very interested in what uh, CEPI is announcing with Institute uh, Pasteur. I think there's still a bit of a gap about what <coughs> leadership and oversight is needed going forward, and our panel was clear that really keeping the focus of world leaders on these issues through a kind of Global <laughs> Health Threats Council is very, very important. And we'd like to see the, the high-level meeting in New York in September uh, focus on that. But suffice to say, we could have been well into the neglect phase. 
because of the ongoing momentum of COVID, not least in China now, I think there's a chance to keep the focus on and get the lasting reforms that we need to do better next time, learning from this rather sad experience of the last three years. Thank you. <coughs> Tony, let me, let me ask you, 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 you've sat in a, a chair very similar to Helen's. You, I'm interested in your perspectives on maintaining political focus as well. Yeah, well, the, the, the best way to maintain political focus, because, I mean, the, the reality is for the political debate in many, many countries now, COVID is in the rear view mirror. I mean, it, it isn't, but believe me, most the people sitting in Downing Street at the moment are not talking about COVID. And um, at the G7 and the G20, I think you won't get the focus you need unless it's clear Two things. One, that there is an ongoing challenge and opportunity. And I think that is not just about COVID. It's about the fact that we are going to have a whole slew of new vaccines, injectables, that are going to deal with some of the, the worst diseases in the world, that give us the opportunity to make big changes in the, in the health of the world. And if you want the politicians to focus, they need to think, look, this is coming down the track soon, because if you tell them about a future pandemic, they'll kind of go, yeah, no, maybe someone else's problem. But you tell them, actually, in the next few years, you're going to have the opportunity to make a big difference to the health care of your population. That will focus them. But the second thing they need is to focus on the, on the opportunities to change health care that have arisen as a result of our experience of COVID. Because, you know, when it's all said and done, it's, it was still a pretty remarkable operation. And by the way, you know, Seppi did a fantastic job. You guys deserve a lot of congratulation for it. But so I think it's around things like how do you make sure you get the right scientific cooperation and the cooperation <laughs> between the regulatory authorities so in the future you can clear things much faster. For example, on the continent of Africa, if we had an equivalent to the European Medicines Agency, we had an African med Medicines Agency that allowed you to have one system, one standard, which hugely changed the way that um, vaccines and treatments are <coughs> introduced in Africa. Um, I think that this issue of manufacturing, so a lot of company, countries learned that if they didn't have some recourse to, to manufacturing sovereignty, if you like, um, either directly or indirectly through partnerships with other countries, then they were at a disadvantage. I think there's a huge impetus now for a national digital infrastructure. Digitization in, in healthcare is, I think, one of the great game changers. You know, we should be helping countries to develop a national digital infrastructure, which they will need with these new vaccines. And then, you know, finally, it, it, it's, it's also about showing people and showing the political leadership that you can make a positive difference to your healthcare system by adopting these measures because they've got a They've got an impact beyond any particular disease and, or, or, or pandemic. So I think if you want to keep the political focus, and I agree it's vital that you do, you've got to show people that this is a continuing issue. Right? It's not a future issue. It's here and now. Uh, it's got a broad set of implications. And there are a set of solutions that COVID has taught us arising out of the challenges uh, of COVID, to which if we apply the right political will, we can make our healthcare systems better, not just for pandemic and disease, but more generally for the health of the, the population. If you do that, um, if you do that, they'll think they'll vote in it, and you know, if there are votes in it, they'll, yeah. <laughs> they'll focus. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, Minister Moreno, I want to pick up a couple of themes that have already been mentioned, certainly the manufacturing effort, the expansion of manufacturing, but I, I, I think, uh, Tony has pointed to some important opportunities to improve healthcare um, for all populations. Um, the African Union has set a goal for Africa to develop and produce uh, more and more of its own vaccines to achieve, I think you use the term, manufacturing sovereignty um, and self-sufficiency. What challenges, as, as Minister of Industry and Trade, how, what challenges do you see to making that a reality? How, how, can the, how can the world help Africa succeed in that ambition? Thank you very much. Uh, let me start by saying thank you for inviting me for this panel. This is an opportunity to share what's happening in Africa, and especially my country, Mozambique. 
I uh, would like to start by saying that uh, you may be aware that uh, Africa has, as today's United States estimates, 1.4 billion people. And uh, 1.2 of those people are in the sub saharan area, uh, where the expenditure in health is not more than 2%. And this is something that has to be looked very carefully. Of course, um, the pandemic has shown us that we need to look at infrastructures. We do like infrastructures of health. We have poor systems. We have in Africa lack of profession, professionals in health. And all those things has come up with the pandemic. And what we need to do is quickly organize ourselves, put the systems working, get the partnership, the best partnership in the world, and we are lucky because in South Africa we have already uh, production of vaccines, and this will be help the, uh, the whole continent. The challenge is actual, as uh, Prime Minister Blaise said, that we need to get an identity who can look at this, the, all the systems. We have in each country completely different procedures, different systems, and we, when we look for the way how we needed to, uh, w w w the way how we need to tackle the pandemic or whatever happens uh, in the in the future, it means that we need a unique system, a system that can be similar in all our countries. But of course, uh, you, 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 we we are 55 countries in Africa, and um, uh, the, the, each country has has own procedures and the legislation is completely different. Even if in and when it comes to the health, so you have so much uh, different uh, system that we need to look at that first of all. Uh, secondly, um, I think there is a chance for us um, as we are running for a free trade. Uh, area uh, for the whole Africa. So this is a project going on. Maybe we can check that and uh, join the efforts and uh, when bring the, the, the vaccine manufacturers, uh, use it and they quickly have the distribution system for the whole Africa. Uh, in Africa, we have uh, all those kind of problems in health, but uh, uh, the challenge is uh, um, putting the hands together uh, getting the, um, the, health, uh, the help of uh, um, the institutions, the old, the old institutions, uh, to, to, to attract um, the best manufacturers of vaccines and the take advantage of uh, uh, the, the way how we think that the trade must be uh, guided in, in the next, next step. Great. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, Albert, um, first, congratulations on, on the recent announcement <coughs> on the expansion of, of Pfizer's access program. That, that is a terrific step, but I, I want to come back to the theme on the 100 days mission. Pfizer broke every land speed record in delivering a new vaccine. Uh, by my count, it was 326 days from the release of the sequences to the first emergency authorization of the Pfizer vaccine, and you did that on the fly. Uh, establishing partnerships, pulling a program together, building manufacturing capacity or expanding manufacturing capacity. What opportunities do you see to further compress those timelines and what barriers need to be overcome to be able to deliver vaccines even much more rapidly than we did in 2020? Thank you. First of all, it's a great honor to be part of this panel with two ex-iconic prime ministers and acting minister of finance, you the head of SEP. It's a great honor for me. Um, looking back how we were able to do it, really, I don't know. Uh, it's not only that, uh, uh, and it's not the ability to execute a very technically challenged tasks, but it was also a series of decisions that had to be made that were 50-50, and uh, you had to make all of them right to be able to eventually deliver in eight, eight months. And uh, so we were blessed to be able to do it. Now, there were a lot of challenges that we faced, and there were technical challenges, uh, including the choice of the technology, which was not, uh, it was a technology mRNA that had not delivered any product until that time, building manufacturing capacity for a product that was never manufactured before, just to give you a magnitude of the, 
of the, of the scale we are speaking now, Pfizer before pandemic was producing 200 million doses vaccines every year for all the vaccines that we have in the world. The first year of the pandemic, we produced 3 billion doses of a vaccine that we never had manufactured before. That's very challenging technically to do. Then logistical challenges. These vaccines had to be transferred in minus 70 degrees. We have never built in the world a logistical channel to be able to do something like that. And that can go on and on. But if you ask me what was financial challenges, as you know, Pfizer is a very big corporation, but also we never accepted money from, uh, from, from government. So all of that was part of the daily life that we, we had, all of us at Pfizer. But if you ask me what was the biggest challenge, I think it was the political challenge. I think the vaccines, the COVID, and the ability to deliver or not vaccines, and then after we deliver the ability to use them or not, became severely politicized and became a political statement if you are wearing a mask or not became a political statement if you believe we will have a vaccine or not. And after we had the vaccine, it became a political statement if you believe it works or not. And then we went to more extremes, if you believe that COVID existed or not. All of these were constantly on our way. And you know, I'm a businessman, I'm a scientist, I'm not a politician. To be, and the same is the same for all of my peers, right? The, 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 the head of Moderna, the head of j and the head of AstraZeneca, that they were trying to do the same. And that we found it the most challenging of all the tasks. And that continued after the vaccine. As you know, um, governments, everybody was scared at that time. So what was the result? Everybody tried to protect their own nation. So the protection is how it was manifested in our ability to deliver. Borders were closed. So you can't export vaccine. You can't send it to anybody else other than in, uh, keep it in the US. Keep it in India. India closed, really, their borders. Europe was the only continent that were allowing part of the production in European soil to be exported. And, to their, uh, and congratulations to doing that. But still part, right? But at least there was the first six months of the pandemic that everybody was receiving vaccine from their own soil and everybody else from Europe. So that's something that also need to give credit to them. So for me, looking ahead now, uh, how can we make sure that uh, we can uh, be better prepared to do faster uh, in an unknown pandemic that we don't know what will be the nature of it? I think we should analyze what was the success factors in this one. And I think there were so many, but one that stands out was that the world was lucky that there was a thriving life sciences sector that was at its peak of its performance that was able to strike a phenomenal collaboration during the pandemic with regulatory agencies. That's the secret. The secret that there were all these companies in the world that were ready scientifically to address the challenge, and they worked hand in hand with regulators that were spending sleepless nights to be able to review the progress so that they can authorize the next step, so that we can be able to move. And the second is, if we were able to do it in COVID, why not? We cannot repeat it in Alzheimer's, in cancer, in Parkinson, you know, many other diseases. Those are the two characteristics. So for me, the world should start from here. How can we make sure, one, that we maintain in the world a thriving, scientifically based life sciences sector with the partnership between private and academia and biotechs? And the second is, how can we take the lessons of COVID, collaboration between regulators and companies, and apply them to other severe medical needs of humanity. Great, thank you. Albert, let me, let me stick with you, actually, uh, and, and follow up on that question. I mean, Pfizer was unique among all of the companies that delivered vaccines in not taking um, public sector resources to support the R&D, which had to have taken incredible courage on your part, on the part of your senior management, to make those decisions given the unknowns, given the untested <coughs> technology. Um, but then you described the engagement with regulators. Certainly, Pfizer engaged with governments around procurement. Um, from your perspective, which was, is unique among all of the companies that responded to the pandemic, what are, what are going to be the key factors that, um, between, in the public-private partnerships that we need to have 
for the future? What are the areas where we need to focus our efforts to have the right kinds of public and private sector engagement? I spoke already about the regulators. This is a highly regulated, uh, let's say, business, highly regulated effort. Uh, before you do anything, you need to get an approval from regulators. These steps could take five, six months. We saw the phenomenon that uh, Pfizer scientists will work for a week overnight. Clearly, the last night, 7 o'clock in the morning, sleepless nights, press the button to send something to FDA or to EMA, and then scientists in FDA or EMA will receive the dosage and will spend a week sleepless, no sleep at all, so that they can turn around and send the reply in three or four days. That went magnificently well, very well. Uh, what I felt could have been way better for all was if the restrictions in trade were not imposed. They were imposed by fear, but there was not a single country that they had full sovereignty, as you said it, in the manufacturing. Because although we may were doing it in the beginning in Europe or in the US, the components were made all over the world. And they were unique. There were pieces that we had to import from Europe to the US, from UK to Europe, from uh, multiple from China, from India, from all over the world, that uh, if any of them was closing as a retaliation, you are not allowing me to export vaccine, I'm not allowing you to receive nanoparticles. Then the whole world will be, so I felt that <coughs> was critical. So in the, in the next phase, I think this is something that needs to be addressed, that everybody should remain calm, we should have some rules, nobody stops anything, because otherwise we are uh, all going to lose, but then we have an orchestrated way to have an equitable way of distributing. Minister Moreno, let me, let me pick up on that. Uh, Albert has, has talked about the, these trade restrictions and trade barriers. It, 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 uh, it, it's kind of famous in, in, in our community that hundreds of components uh, that went into the Pfizer vaccine, for example, sourced from dozens of countries. What opportunities do you see through current trade efforts, and you, you mentioned the free trade area in Africa, uh, how, can, how can that be linked with pandemic preparedness, and particularly with the focus on enabling uh, rapid delivery of countermeasures? Thank you very much once again. <clears throat> well, the, the free trade area will be a very good opportunity, uh, special uh, to enable the uh, uh, the, the way uh, how the distribution system can work. With the free trade area, we will, uh, like it happens in, in, the, in the European Union, have uh, um, a no, no barriers for moving the goods and services from one country to another. But more than that, uh, we will be able to use the capabilities of uh, a country uh, uh, from the north of, of uh, Africa uh, to, to the south. Uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> investing in, in new manufacturers in Africa can be a very good opportunity, especially uh, because, uh, we, we, as, as I said, Africa has a uh, lack of uh, everything in terms of uh, uh, medicines, in terms of uh, 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 drugs. Uh, we have challenges uh, in terms of control. Uh, we have uh, counterfeit drugs coming in uh, from somewhere, from Asia and from, from, from America. And uh, the challenge uh, for us is actually making sure that all those uh, products can be used in the country. Of course, uh, the, 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 <coughs> the source of uh, um, uh, raw material, let us say, for the pharmaceutical, uh, we have uh, capabilities. We have potentials in Africa uh, to produce more of them. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the, the agriculture products and all those products and be used for, for, for some, some, some medicines. Um, we have an experience now, a uh, recent experience from, from Rwanda, who has started uh, the production of medicine and it has been a success. Uh, it has put the price of medicines going down and of course uh, uh, we need to, uh, 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 to, to to replicate that uh, uh, experience from Rwanda for, in other countries. The ones who have the potential, the industrial potential, to to to, to put new 
new factories and new producers. Uh, as I said, well, the, the, uh, the market is open. Uh, the market is open. Uh, the market wants uh, good medicine. The market wants good investors. The market uh, is looking for good products and uh, definitely for good services. So there's an opportunity in Africa for that. Terrific. Thank you. Um, Tony, I'm going to skip over you for a minute. I'm going to come back to you, I promise. Uh, but uh, Helen, given, given your work on the IPPR and uh, talking about some of the opportunities that Minister Moreno mm. just mentioned and, and the financing that will be required to support that, um, in the context of the current fiscal constraints, the debt burden that many, many countries are facing, mm. what kinds of financing do we need to bring to pandemic preparedness and response? And, how do, how do we <coughs> take that message to stressed ministries of finance? Mm. Well, I think we saw in the current pandemic response that the uh, model of relying on, in effect, charitable funding didn't work terrifically well. And we're now you know, seeing with the establishment of the pandemic fund uh, for uh, preparedness, uh, conventionally agreed, I think, that you need around 10 and a half to... 15 billion a year being put into uh, support for low and middle income country uh, preparedness efforts. They will, of course, contribute a lot themselves, but solidarity is needed as well. And the fund is about 10% you know, of the way to the lower end of that, that target. Our panel advocated uh, what's uh, perhaps called in the, the jargon a global public investment approach. Uh, and the advocates of GPI uh, advocate that any future fund should be set up using these principles, where you set up on a sort of member state basis on an ability to pay uh, from each according to their means and to each according to their needs, which is how WHO or <coughs> core funding of the, the UN or whatever is, is financed. Uh, that would mean, for example, that Mozambique as an LDC would pay in a very, very small amount. But of course, when it came to the allocation, uh, would be uh, getting a, a, a significant yeah. uh, allocation along yeah. with other uh, LDCs. So that, I think, should be the model. If you spread, say, $10.5 billion across a cost-sharing formula like that, it actually doesn't amount to a lot for anyone, even for, you know, say, the US, which is always, by size of economy and GDP, uh, the, the biggest contributor. So that would be the kind of approach that, that we would advocate. And I, you know, maybe hold some hope that at some point the pandemic fund could transition to something like that. I think it, it's great that it's up and running and I'm quite encouraged by the direction that I hear it's taking. But over time, if it could transition to a, you know, even more inclusive model with a more broadly based finance, I think that would be helpful. Great. Um, Tony, I want to switch gears slightly. We, we, you, t you talked about the importance of linking the development of new countermeasures and capabilities to develop new countermeasures to ability and opportunities to deliver health care in the here and now, and that that was critical to securing political buy-in. During the pandemic, we, we saw, as I said, there were multiple causes for the inequities of access that we saw, even after billions of doses of vaccine had been delivered, 12 billion doses in the, in the first year. Many countries encountered difficulties in delivery and would be very interested in your thoughts of maybe the work of the Institute on, on how to improve access to medicine so that if we can deliver vaccines in 100 days and other countermeasures in 100 days, how do we then get them to the people that need them? Yeah, I think it's a really important question. And, um, so Albert was talking earlier about the, the, the politics of the, the situation. And I think the sort of unforgivable politics and forgivable <coughs> politics. Um, the, the unforgivable politics is turning a public health issue into a political issue. I mean, I remember at the beginning of the, at the onset of COVID, people saying, well, what do you think <coughs> of the politics of COVID? How serious is this disease? And I was like, well, you asked me about the politics of the disease. I mean, it's a disease. I don't, I don't know. You go and ask someone who knows. <laughs> so what's unforgivable is turning things like whether you wear a face mask or not into a political issue. That is unforgivable and stupid, right? But there's a forgivable politics, which you see also, by the way, when it comes to 
Russia and Ukraine and energy prices. If you're a politician and you're facing an election and you've got the ability to vaccinate your people, you're going to vaccinate your people first. Right? So how, the question really is, how do, you, how do you create a situation in which that, that more forgivable political anxiety is dealt with by a plan that allows you now to work on what are the elements you're going to need in order for this to be dealt in, with in the future equitably and properly. And, you know, I, I mean, I always, I love listening to Albert because he's an expert that I can actually understand. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the thing that he's saying, I think, is so important just to, 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 to alight on, which is that you, you, you've got to put the different elements of the players in this that are going to be important in making sure not just that a future pandemic is well handled, but that healthcare systems are de developed properly. And as new treatments come online, then they're made available to more people. <coughs> You've got to get the right people in a partnership together to work out how they create the mechanism so that in the future, it's better than it was in the past. And that is about getting the major pharmaceutical people, <coughs> life science people, working with the regulators, with the governments understanding <coughs> what it is they need to do um, in order to make sure that, that they're not left in a situation where they're scrabbling for vaccine or for equipment that they're going to need, but that there's going to be sufficient provision and that there's going to be the ability <coughs> to manufacture in, in countries in which there's not going to be the same problem. I think there's, a, there's going to be a, a move, I think, probably to set up manufacturing hubs but in countries maybe that are small population countries, because if you're a manufacturing hub in a large population country, you're going to have to look after that population first. Um, and I also think this, this issue to do with the technology and the digital infrastructure, I just want to emphasize how important I think that is. Because in the end, you, 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 you need the data. You need to know who's been vaccinated and who hasn't been. Some of the vaccines that will come on down the line will be multiple There'll be multiple shots. So you've got to have, for, for reasons to do with the healthcare more generally, but certainly for a, a pandemic or for, um, for, for vaccines, you've got to have a proper digital infrastructure. And many countries don't have that. In fact, most countries don't have that. So again, you've got to say, OK, who are the people that can <coughs> make this happen? How do you get the right partnerships in place? So my, my view is this is what I'm arguing with the, to, that should happen in the G, G20 particularly, I think, which is... I mean, G7 is an important forum, but the G20 is the broader forum, um, is you, you've got to work out what is it that you want to achieve in order to make sure that any future pandemic is properly handled, and what are the partnerships that you're going to create in order to ensure that the answers you get are the right answers. And then you're going to have to have the mechanisms of implementation. And those mechanisms will be partly through the formal institutions that you have, like the WTO, but they'll also be through organizations like, like, like yours, which are, which I think, you know, have many advantages because they don't get landed with the same bureaucracy and, uh, frankly, <coughs> small p politics around them. So I think, you know, that's what we need to do. But if you want the politicians to focus on a plan, I promise you, it's got to be because they think in the next few years, not in the broad future, it's going to matter to them to have that plan. Let me, let, me, let me just make a, in, inject a comment of my own. You, you, you raised the importance of the, the digital infrastructure. And we saw in countries that had good digital infrastructure, Israel, uh, for example, was, with its ability to assess the efficacy and effectiveness of the Pfizer and other vaccines, the UK, where the national health system allowed very rapid evaluations of the efficacy of different kinds of approaches, they made disproportionate contributions to our understanding of COVID and to the delivery <coughs> of improved clinical care when we were learning really, really rapidly. Uh, right. One other thing, by the way, is genomic sequencing, I think. Yep. How, do we, how do we establish the right network of that? And how do we make sure that if you are discovering things in a country because they're doing a lot of genomic sequencing, for example, like the South Africans did, you don't end up having that country feel they've got a problem because they've discovered a new variant. Well, that's, that, that's exactly what we saw, of course, was that South Africa was punished for doing the right thing. And when we have to create systems, and hopefully the <coughs> pandemic treaty 
we'll, we'll do this that will we'll prevent mm. that kind of, I, I think, knee-jerk backlash. I, it's hard to, hard to avoid. We've got um, maybe, maybe just a minute or two. Let me, let me ask any, anyone on the panel if there were um, thoughts that were stimulated by the comments of your fellow panelists, if you wanted to inject any last uh, thoughts. Helen, you look like you. Well, <laughs> the last thought uh, perhaps would be <coughs> to get some discussion around the, the various possibilities for countermeasures uh, going, going forward. And uh, I've put my name to uh, a Lancet comment uh, which talks about the, you know, the importance really of building on this concept that WHO has begun with the regional mRNA uh, hub. Uh, it could be expanded, obviously, to different, different locations and a wider range of technologies. But I think uh, having a system where uh, scientists around the world's regions, from LMICs uh, to HICs, are able to collaborate and cooperate on, on designing uh, what, what we need for, for the future is, is important. I think there's also governance and financing uh, issues uh, going forward as to how we uh, support the, the development of that and then the equitable rollout. And I think the, the regional manufacturing is just a no-brainer. We need distributed uh, manufacturing for all the reasons that have been, uh, have been raised. And you made in your opening uh, comments, Richard, the point about uh, both the structural issues and the scarcity. I think we've got a chance of overcoming both of those. Great. Thank you. Um, let me just briefly sum up, and then I'll invite uh, Sean Bishon up to make a, a couple of concluding remarks. Um, it's been a great session. We've, we've covered a wide range of topics, from scientific discovery, from risk-taking in industry, uh, to the need for trade agreements, to efforts to expand manufacturing, um, to issues of financing and delivery of healthcare, and how we can link um, what we are trying to do to advance pandemic preparedness with the delivery of healthcare every day. And, and to help politicians see that as an opportunity uh, so that this is something that they can continue to focus on. I Tony, I liked your uh, forgivable and unforgivable politics. I haven't heard that distinction before, but I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very apropos. Um, with that, I want to thank all of you for coming. Let me invite Sham Bishan uh, up. I think he wants to make a few quick remarks. <coughs> Thank you, Richard. Uh, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shyam Bishen, and I head up the health and healthcare division here at the World Economic Forum. So first of all, from uh, World Economic Forum, a big thank you to you, Richard, for moderating this session. And huge thank you for our speakers, uh, Right Honorable Prime Minister Clark, Right Honorable Prime Minister uh, Blair, Honorable Prime Minister, uh, Honorable Minister Moreno, and Dr. Borla. Great comments, very useful. Uh, one thing I want to make sure that we emphasize here today is, as Richard also pointed out, this is a sixth year anniversary for CEPI. CEPI was created here in 2017 at the annual meeting right here in Davos, and what a great success it has been. It's been a fantastic success. Richard has done a great job of leading this organization. So big hand to uh, Richard and big hand to CEPI. It's a great, we have been talking about public-private partnership. It's a great example of public-private partnership. Uh, obviously, there is Gavi that was created here several years ago, and both Gavi and CEPI has been so instrumental during this uh, pandemic, during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's also because of uh, Richard's leadership that 100-day uh, mission that we talked about is now included in G7 health agenda which is a great achievement, you know. I think we need to get it uh, on, on top of G7. And as you said, uh, uh, Prime Minister Blair, it should be also part of G20 agenda. Uh, two other things I would like to point out here in my closing remarks in terms of what we are doing from the World Economic Forum to help on the pandemic preparedness side. One is, Richard, you already mentioned, and, and so did the Prime Minister, and, uh, in terms of the regionalized vaccine manufacturing. So regional vaccine manufacturing, we launched this initiative at the World Economic Forum together with Victor Zhao, uh, President of National Academy of Medicine and CEPI uh, about a year ago. And uh, it's coming up with roadmap, which will be discussed today actually at four o'clock, I think, uh, Laura, at three o'clock, sorry. Uh, so I invite uh, people here, you know, whoever can join uh, to look at what we have done and then what's the, what's the um, opportunity uh, uh, going forward. 
And then the second one is, again, uh, Prime Minister Blair, you talked about the pathogen surveillance. Uh, we are working with Africa CDC. We are working with public and private partners to bring that together so that we can all access, as soon as there is a pathogen that we identify, we can have access to the data. The whole world can, ac can have access to data. We don't repeat the South Africa example. We don't penalize countries for sharing their information, for, for sharing the data. And we come up with medical countermeasures, whether it's vaccines, diagnostics, uh, or treatments. So I think that's something that's very important, and we have launched that initiative. We are working on that. Um, so that's, uh, I think, uh, very critical here. We, I don't think we are going to avoid outbreaks. Those will happen the way we live, with the growth of population, with climate change, infectious diseases will come through, there will be outbreaks. How do we stop them from blowing into pandemics? That's the question. How do we catch those early on so that we can come up with these uh, medical countermeasures and stop those? So with that, I know we are over time, so I will stop here. Thank you again, Richard. Thank you again, speakers, and everyone for participating here. Thank you.